and the last, which was dead and is alive. The central focus of the first verse is the resurrection of Christ. And that's what we are celebrating every Sunday, and that's what we celebrate especially next Sunday morning. The people who were undergoing persecution and being killed were reminded of the resurrection. That is the heart of our faith. That's one of those questions. How do you prove it to somebody who's a non-believer? And Jesus says, I know thy works. Did you know works are important? Not for salvation, not for sanctification, but for proof that you are saved and for proof that the Spirit of God is sanctifying you day by day, setting you apart and producing those works in his power. But that's not the only thing Jesus said I know about. He said, I know your tribulation. I know what you're going through. Did you know you never go through anything that Jesus doesn't know about it? Did you know that if Jesus wanted to do something about it, he could remove it? Did you know that sometimes tribulation is in the sovereign best interests that God has for you? Because God can stop it at any point that he wants to do so. And he's not ignorant of it. I know your tribulation. Let that one sink in. We complain when we go through hard times. What we're saying is, God, you don't know what you're doing. The church at Smyrna did not complain about what they were going through. You and I have never suffered it. Christians in North Korea suffer it. Christians in Saudi Arabia suffer it. Christians in Afghanistan suffer it. Christians in many countries that are primarily Roman Catholic suffer it. But you and I have never suffered it. Smyrna suffered it. The third thing Jesus says he knows about them, he says, I know your poverty. Now, you know, if these people had a lot of money, they could say, well, okay, we got some good works and Christ is going to work orders for those. And we may be going through a little bit of tough time, but we got money in the bank. We can handle it because our money is there and we got a cushion for our retirement we got some money. We can always go out and buy food, even if it costs us a lot when people know that we're Christians, but we can still get it. We got money. We can get out of town. We can hire the, uh, the local taxi cab chariot, and that can just run us right out of town and down to one of these other cities. These people were poor. You and I have never been poor. Now, there have been some times when I thought I was poor, but you know what? I've never gone hungry. Even though I thought I was poor when I had 13 kids, and well, I still have 13 kids, but <laughs> when I was supporting 13 kids and trying to go to school, I never had to borrow a, a nickel or a penny. I mean, sometimes I didn't have two of them to rub together, but I wasn't poor. I had everything that I needed. These people were poor. But then Jesus adds a parenthesis because he wants them to remember that there's a contrast between material poverty and spiritual poverty, between material wealth and spiritual wealth. And so he says, but thou art rich. Wow. That was a church that had something to look forward to. They weren't looking forward to it on earth. What they were looking forward to on earth was suffering and imprisonment and martyrdom. They were looking forward to all kinds of tortures and all kinds of other horrible things, but 
they also had a long range viewpoint. They were rich. And then Jesus talks about their opponents. I know the blasphemy of them that say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Now, these were people that were going to synagogue. These were people who could trace their ancestry back to Abraham. But Jesus is here reminding the church of what he had said about the Jews in John chapter 8. Jesus had told them that God could raise up from the stones children to Abraham. He said, you're not really children of Abraham, you're children of your father, the devil, and the works of your father you do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. He's a liar and the father of lies, and what he speaks is a lie. These people were physically Jews, but the synagogue was not controlled by God. The synagogue was controlled by Satan. In fact, because it was, the synagogue was going to be behind something that happens in verse 10. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you up. The synagogue of Satan. Here's the devil. So he's going to cast, and what's he going to use to do it? Well, it tells you which people he controls. The devil uses people just like God uses people. The devil motivates people just like God motivates people. The devil empowers people just like the Holy Spirit empowers people. And the devil can empower people to do magic tricks and to do pseudo-miracles. We'll see that very clearly when we get over to the book of Revelation. When we see the false prophet, when we see the beast who is receiving a deadly wound that's healed and the whole world wonders after the beast and we have a counterfeit resurrection, Satan can work wonders. He has lying powers, lying signs, lying wonders, but he can do them. The devil, using people, will cast you into prison that you may be tried. That is, that you will be put to the test. Did you know your faith is going to be put to the test? He's not talking about going through a legal trial here. He's talking about testing. And he says, you know, the devil is going to check some of you out. He's going to put you to the test. Next time you decide to fall apart at the seams, next time you decide that things are too tough, just remember the devil likes to test people to see if they've got faith, to see if their faith is genuine or to see if they're going to panic, if they're going to get frustrated, if they're going to fall apart at the seams, if they're going to throw in the towel, if they're going to give up, if they're going to run away, if they're going to compromise. He tests us in all of those different ways. The question is, what are you going to do when the pressure comes? How are you going to respond? It says that ye may be tried and you shall have tribulation. That's a very powerful word, 10 days. Now, we're going to take it as 10 days because that's what it says, 10 days. And there's nothing in the context to say that it's anything else besides 10 days. It was a short period of time, but it was an intense period of time. And at the end of that period of time, there are going to be some people who get killed. Because we know that, it says, be thou faithful unto death. You're going to have 10 days in prison of the worst sort. And at the end of the 10 days, you're going to die. And your test is going to be, will you hang in there even for 10 days? See, well, 10 days seems like a piece of cake. I mean, it's better than having to stay in prison for, you know, all that time like Joseph stayed in prison down in Egypt and, you know, and the misery that he went through. Listen, people. Ten days of torture in a prison could seem like eternity and you'd be wishing for death. Ten days in a prison with that kind of torture would make you want to say, I deny Jesus. Whatever you want me to do, whatever you want me to say, I'll say it. Just let me out of here. 
you should be tried ten days. But he says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Remember, he introduced himself as the risen Christ. Here he's talking about them being killed, but he promises them the crown of life. He can do it. He's the resurrected Christ. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the church at Smyrna only. This doesn't apply to anybody else, but only to the church at Smyrna. Is that what it says? What the Spirit saith unto the churches. That means it applies to us. We're going to see stuff out of each one of the churches, of the seven churches, that applies to Bible Presbyterian Church, which is not the buildings, it's the people. This is something that could happen to us. He that overcometh. What are we talking about by he that overcometh? Well, it's back there in verse 10. Be faithful unto death. He's the one that overcomes. And if you're faithful unto the first death, you will not be overcome of the second death, which is the lake of fire, burning with fire and brimstone. Now, with that as our starting point, I want to point out a few more things that tie Ephesus to Smyrna. Last week, we finished up with the church at Ephesus, began our study of the church at Smyrna, and we saw that even though the Ephesians hated the Nicolaitans, Paul had prophesied the defection and the destruction of the church at Ephesus, even though they were the most doctrinally sound of all the seven churches. Now, even though they rejected the doctrine and practice of the Nicolaitans, Satan used the defection and the corruption of the elders at Ephesus to drag them into false doctrine that ended in horrible false practice, just like Israel, Balaam, Hezekiah, and the rest of the passages that I used to set the stage over the last two weeks. I gave you five reasons that Ephesus should not have fallen into Fox false doctrine, and yet they did. The five reasons were, number one, Paul started the church. Man, that alone ought to have been enough. And he's the one that taught them. He gave them all their basic Bible doctrine. Number two, Paul ordained the elders. He selected those guys. Three, Paul had written the incredible book of Ephesians to that church. They had a written testimony especially designed for their particular specific church. Number four, church history records for us that Timothy was ordained the first bishop of Ephesus close to the time of the death of Paul. You know, these early churches had some pretty good guys getting them started. We see that over with Smyrna also, where we talked about Polycarp last week, and he was a disciple of John the Apostle. There were some pretty good guys that were involved in the foundation of these churches. Number five, Christ himself commended the church 30 years later 30 years after that Acts passage, on their firm doctrinal stance in the book of Revelation when he warned them about the consequences of losing their first love. So we asked the question, how did the devil finally get into the church at Ephesus? And I showed you that it was through an ecumenical council. Just remember, the so-called ecumenical movement is of the devil. If you let others come in who do not agree with your doctrine, and then you let them participate in official activities that set both the doctrinal and practical stance of the church, eventually apostates will creep into the church and, and change it from the inside. You know it. The devil loves to steal things that God's people have built. You think of things like Princeton Theological Seminary. You think of Dartmouth. You think of Yale. You think of Brown University. These were all built by Christians for specific purposes. Princeton was the log college of New Jersey. Many of these colleges were designed to carry the gospel to American Indians, you know, training ministers of the gospel to preach. And the devil's stolen all of them. The devil loves to do that. He did that at Ephesus. That's one of the reasons, as you know, that I have encouraged you here in this church for more than 10 years not to allow new members to join immediately, but to wait until they have faithfully attended multiple weekly services for more than a year so that you get to know them to really know them before they join. Ephesus was like us doctrinally, but as the church began to lose members through death and attrition and shrink in that changing culture, they, like us, became desperate for members. Leadership was divided and they began to join forces with divergent so-called Christian groups 
who eventually took over the church and ultimately killed it. The Council of Ephesus was an early church council called to so-called hammer out doctrine that was believed by the church and theoretically to stop the spread of heresy and apostasy, but that council ended up by inserting heresy as official doctrine. I shared with you how this location, the site of the most doctrinally sound church in Revelation, was where Satan introduced Mariolatry and also showed you the various stages in Roman Catholic history where that blasphemous doctrine was added to and developed. And I call it a blasphemous doctrine because it takes away from Christ. It exalts a human being instead of Christ. It was at the Council of Ephesus in 431 AD that the council invented the exaltation of Mary, and it was the first church council to apply the term Mother of God to Mary. That was the church that lost its first love for Christ and ended up loving Mary instead. Here's a warning. Failing to practice the Bible doctrine of separation, they couldn't resist the pull of their culture, a culture that was in love with a mother goddess. A mother goddess, Diana of the Ephesians. It was at Ephesus that Mary became the queen of heaven. That's a term also used for various fertility cult goddesses in the ancient pagan world. Did you know that there were many pagan cultures that worshipped the queen of heaven with cultic prostitution? The wrong kind of love. So what's the lesson? Without love for Christ, sound doctrine eventually erodes into pagan sex orgies and erotic sensual love for pagan gods. That's how the devil finally got Ephesus by pulling them to worship Mary. Just as the Queen of Heaven was a mother goddess, so Mary was given the title Mother of God at Ephesus. She had a biblical name. <laughs> hmm. We'll see what biblical name that is in a moment. But was merely identified with the many-breasted Diana in disguise. We saw the passion of the Ephesian pagans for the goddess Diana, a mother goddess, in Acts 19. It was at Ephesus that Paul found disciples of John the Baptist and pointed them to Christ. But it was also at Ephesus that Paul discovered demon-possessed people and people using magic, magic incantations in the synagogue where he preached. That was all at Ephesus. I suspect, though I can't prove it, that some of those demons, remember the seven sons of Sceva who were running around trying to cast out demons? And they were the sons of the chief priest there in the Ephesian synagogue. I suspect that some of those demons eventually worked their way into the church at Ephesus where they trashed the church in 431 AD. Initially, there was a clear separation of the Ephesian church to true doctrine with the corresponding abandonment of pagan practices. That was at the very beginning. Many that came believed and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also which used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. I mean, these were people who had started out deeply immersed in demonism. And because they killed it at the beginning, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. So the devil said, well, I'll wait. They got a bunch of people right now, but I know some tricks by which I can get that church. Anyway, we concluded by showing that pagan sex goddess worship is still alive in the evangelical church today through the devil's tool of pornography. And I pointed out that research has shown that in most evangelical Bible-believing churches, approximately one half of the men are involved in pornography, and though a smaller percentage, many of the women as well. That's very serious. It's merely a digital version of the ancient perversions that we see manifested in the Balaam incident, the Ephesian decay, and it teaches us that sex outside of marriage by believers will always destroy a church, rotting it from the inside out just like it did at Ephesus. Now, I wanted to add tonight a few more things about the so-called Queen of Heaven before we get back to Smyrna. Remember, <clears throat> it was from the roots of the Council of Ephesus that this term eventually worked its way into the theology of Rome. I'm sure that you're aware that the name Queen of Heaven is one of the principal names that the Roman Catholic institution gives to Mary. And it is a biblical name. But where did it come from? Very few Christians know anything about the prophet Jeremiah. Although, as I hope you saw this morning, 
it was Jeremiah who was central to the Daniel understanding the prophecy of the 70 year Babylonian captivity and thus Jeremiah is central to understanding the prophecy of the triumphal entry and the death of Messiah the Prince. But unfortunately all that most Christians know about Jeremiah is that he was the weeping pro prophet <laughs> and he obviously had a lot to cry about. But did you know that Jeremiah was the prophet who warned God's people in horror not to pursue the queen of heaven? Let me just read you a few passages uh, where Jeremiah talks about the queen of heaven. And it was entire families that were involved in it. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 18. The children, they're the little guys, gather wood. Oh, what about the daddies? And the fathers kindle the fire. Hmm, they're the men. And the women, there's the mamas, need their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods that they may provoke me to anger, God speaking. You know, it's not a very good title to give to Mary. <laughs> you get that idea? People who are busy involved in worshiping the queen of heaven, which is a central tenet of Roman Catholicism today. Whole families, daddies, mommies, and kitties. Look down at chapter 44, verse 17. The people speaking. But we will certainly do whatever goeth, thing goeth forth out of our own mouth. We're going to do it whether you like it or not. To burn incense unto the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her, making special little sacrifices to the queen of heaven. You know, they do that in Roman Catholic churches. They bring all kinds of things and put them at the feet of the statues of Mary. They pray to Mary. They ask her to intercede for them, to talk to her mean son Jesus because she's sweet and nice and maybe she can twist his arm a little bit and get him to do what they want him to do, what they want him to do if they use Mary to do it. They pour out their drink offerings under her and the people still talking. As we have done, we and our fathers, our kings, and our princes. Yeah, when we were in faraway lands, you know, because we didn't have any other option. No, that's, it says, in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. And then they tell you why they did it. We're going to do it. What, what, what comes out of our mouth? We don't care what you say about it. We're going to do it anyway because we get a benefit from it. Listen to what the benefit was. For then had we plenty of victuals, and were well, and saw no evil. Hey, this works. Doesn't matter what God said. As long as it works, we got the queen of heaven. Why do you think people, after all these centuries of Romanism, still pray to Mary and the saints? Because folks, it works. There are demons behind every idol, the scripture says so, that desire to be worshipped. And to keep their worshippers attached, they answer the prayer requests which are made to them instead of made to God. Why do you think pagans fall down and worship certain idols? Because they think those idols know the demons behind the idols are giving them what they want to keep them attached to paganism. And Rome now calls Mary the Queen of Heaven. You know, they believe that failure to worship the Queen of Heaven resulted in suffering and loss. They had talked about how by doing it, they had plenty of vittles, they were healthy, they were well, they didn't have any trouble, they saw no evil. Let me show you the next verse. Because now they're saying, but when we stop doing it, this is what happens. But since we left off to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things. In other words, we're, we're totally lacking. We've been consumed by the sword. We're getting killed. Our enemies are running over us. And not only that, we don't have enough to eat. Remember, they talked about their vittles. Their belly was their god. And, and, and we're dying of famine. That's verse 18. You know what kind of argument that is? That's called the argument of pragmatism. 
That's the argument of feelings. That's the argument of experience. Rather than going back to Revelation, and I say, you know, we need to do that, as Job did, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. The devil's always going to give you little tidbits and little goodies to try to keep you hooked. Look at verse 19. And when we burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured drink out offerings unto her, did we make cakes to worship her and pour out our drink offerings unto her without our men? Now there's women talking say, our men are involved in this too. That's why we're successful. We got all of us. Why do you think that Rome demands that if a Protestant man wants to marry a Catholic girl, they have to get married in the Catholic Church and they have to promise to have all their kids baptized Catholic? They want the men in it too. Verse 25, jumping down a few verses. This is still Jeremiah 44. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, Ye, talking to the men, and your wives, there's the women, have both spoken with your mouth, so you preach it, you talk it, but you don't stop there. And you fulfilled with your hand, you're doing it, it's action, saying, We will surely perform our vows that we have vowed, they were making vows here to burn incense. Incense is worship in scripture when the burning of incense takes place. That's the ascending of the prayers before the throne of God in an act of worship. Oh, but they weren't doing it to God. We vowed to burn incense to the queen of heaven and we're going to do it and to pour out our drink offerings unto her. Ye will surely accomplish your vows and surely perform your vows. Hey, man, we made a promise. We, we can't break our promises. I mean, you know, even your God doesn't like you to break promises, right? Queen of heaven. There you got it. There's Rome. There's what got started at Ephesus. All of the ancient pagan cultures going all the way back to Nimrod in Genesis chapter 10. This is early start, folks. Had a mother goddess with a baby god. Did you know that? All the way back to Nimrod. In the ancient Semitic culture, she was called Astarte or Ashtoreth. You probably remember that Solomon fell into worshiping her in 1 Kings 11.5 and 2 Kings 23.13. Why? Because he married pagan wives. And it says they pulled his heart away from Jehovah. And he actually offered child sacrifices, his own children, by these pagan women who pulled him into the worship of these pagan gods. And he was the wisest man on the face of the earth at that time. Do you understand that this kind of religion has an incredible, strong pull? Because most men, believe it or not, are interested in sex. I mean, I'm blunt. But that's what this thing is all about. And the devil knows that. And so he ties it to this false worship stuff. So they think they're being religious. They think it's okay for them. But even Solomon fell into worshiping Ashtoreth. In Babylon, she was called Ishtar. Did you know that's the name from which we get the word Easter? because it was at that season of the year that her worshipers in this fertility cult worshipped her with rabbits and eggs, signs of fertility. That's why I refer to the day as Resurrection Sunday, not Easter. In Rome, she was called Venus. And you know lots of stuff about Venus and a baby, a little baby god. What's his name? He shoots bows and arrows. Thwing! Cupid, the mother goddess, baby god, goes all the way back to Nimrod. Where does Rome think that it has the biblical authority for all this? <clears throat> this is what ties us back into prophecy again, back to the book of Revelation. 
Did you know that Rome points to, of all places, the book of Revelation to have authority to say that Mary is the queen of heaven? Now, there are two women, two principal women, in Revelation. One of the women is Israel. One of the women is the whore of Babylon riding a scarlet-covered beast. Guess which one Rome wants to identify with and claim that the woman is Mary. You think it's the whore riding the scarlet-colored beast? <laughs> is that the one they, they identify with as Mary? No. They identify with the other one. Let me read the passage that Rome claims for Mary as the queen of heaven. But it refers clearly to Israel, and we'll discuss it in more detail, of course, when we get to Revelation chapter 12, the Lord willing. But here's the Roman Catholic proof text for calling Mary the queen of heaven. Revelation chapter 12. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. She's radiating sunbeams and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Have you ever been into a Catholic church where they had a statue of Mary that looked like this? I've seen these. I've been in all kinds of shrines all over the Holy Land because the Catholics have built churches all over them. I've been in various big cathedrals in New York City and in England and in France to see these places. And you see it sometimes outside the buildings. Here's Mary with her white veil and her blue dress. She's always portrayed that way. She's never portrayed in a red dress or a polka dotted dress. You know, she's always this blue dress and this white veil kind of thing. And um, you see this crown and it's got little stars on the end of it. And you see behind her radiating a sun. And you see the moon under her feet. Mary's portrayed that way many times in Roman Catholic buildings. They're claiming that the woman of Revelation 12 is Mary. I'll tell you why in just a second. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. She's about to have a baby. Ooh, sounds like Mary at the, at the manger. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. We'll talk more about that. That's, of course, the devil when we get to Revelation 12. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And we'll talk about that in relation to the third of the angels that fell with Satan when we get to that point. And did cast them into the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child. So they say, see, this is Mary, and she's the queen of heaven. Because here, it's heaven, it's the sun, it's the moon, it's the stars. And she brought forth a man-child. And here is a reference to Psalm 2, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. Now that's a messianic psalm, Psalm 2 and Psalm 110, two of the most important key messianic psalms about the Lord Jesus Christ. But that's from Psalm 2.9. So Roman Catholics say, do you see, she birthed Jesus. But the problem is that none of the rest of the chapter has anything to do with Mary. It's all about Israel. And Jesus came through Israel. Because the next thing says, the woman, so we're still talking about the same woman, fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Now, folks, I preached it this morning. How many months is that? Of prophetic months of 360 day years. How, how many months? 42 months, it says that elsewhere in Revelation. How many years is that? Three and a half years. Okay? So there's going to be a special time that Israel, when they see the abomination of desolation, he said, don't go back into your house, don't get out of the field. I mean, run for your life. Because you're going to see such trouble as you've never seen before. We'll get more to that when we get to the book of Revelation. Down to verse 13. Because the next thing is the, the battle in heaven between Michael 
the archangel and his angels and the devil and his angels. So we get now down to verse 13. And the dragon saw that he was cast under the earth. He persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. Now that didn't apply to Mary. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness and to her place where she's nourished for a time, times, one plus two and a half time. That's three and a half from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that she might, be, might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman. Now this has, I hope you're picking up on the fact this has nothing to do with Mary. The earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Now wait a minute. Is this telling us that the Jesus of the Bible is the Jesus of Mormonism, which had multiple wives, Martha and Mary and Magdalene and Joanna and Suzanne, Susanna and the other women that are mentioned in the New Testament, and that by those he had a whole bunch of different kids? Whatever the woman is, it says, make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, this is Israel. And there are going to be Jews in the tribulation who don't fall for the Antichrist, who resist him. And God's going to spare a specific number of them. We're going to get to that in Revelation. Because God has promised that Israel will never get wiped out. The bottom line. Satan loves to see Bible-believing, doctrinally sound churches fall into pagan worship. It always happens when a church loses its first love for Christ. Now back to Smyrna. Let me tell you a little bit more about its geography and its current population. Remember we talked about Ephesus, and I've been there and I've walked the streets of Ephesus, and hey man, the church is gone. But how about Smyrna? Smyrna was located at the mouth of the river Meles, M-E-L-E-S. It was one of the finest cities in Asia. It was called Smyrna the Lovely, the crown of Ionia, the ornament of Asia. <clears throat> Pretty nice uh, appellations to have given to your city. I mean, Philadelphia is called the city of love <laughs> simply because that's what its name means. It's not because there is so much love in Philadelphia, although there was Love Park and the big, huge L-O-V-E kind of thing. And, you know, one of the young ladies in our church got engaged there. The guy fell on his knees in front of the thing and offered her the ring and all of that. They love to brag about themselves being the city of love. But hey, Smyrna was a gorgeous place. In ancient times, it was very rich, and it was a very wicked city in Ionia, and it was only 40 miles north of Ephesus. Only 40 miles north of Ephesus. Now, you know, for us today, 40 miles is like nothing. And cities that are 40 miles apart in the same region often have the same kind of character. Think, for example, of uh, two towns in Texas that are only 40 miles apart. Of course, Texas is almost 1,000 miles wide. It's 985 miles wide and 987 miles tall. But 40 miles apart, you, know, you probably won't find much difference in them. But in the ancient world, of course, things are different. 40 miles was a very long distance. And the character of Smyrna was vastly different from Ephesus. Ephesus was, as a political entity, was focused on the worship of Diana. And the principal concern was for pagan gods. But Smyrna was clearly different. In Smyrna, the principal religious opposition came not from pagans. The principal religious opposition came from Jews. And they were Jews of a very vicious sort. In fact, Jesus accuses them of blasphemy. That's rather serious. They were taking upon themselves prerogatives that belonged only to God. They were vocally and viciously opposing their own Messiah. Now, did you know the city of Smyrna still exists today? It not only exists, but it has a very active harbor. In fact, it is the principal city of Anatolia, and it has a mixed population of between 200,000 and 300,000 people. Now, let me tell you something that is really cool. Of that number, nearly 100,000 call themselves Christians. Smyrna! <laughs> you don't see that at Ephesus. The church that was doctrinally sound, 
the church that couldn't bear the Nicolaitans, the church that tried those who called themselves apostles and found they weren't and got rid of them, the church that was like Bible Presbyterian Church, the church that believed in the, the sovereignty of God and all the principles of what we call the principles of the Reformation. It's not there. Because they'd lost their first love. Smyrna obviously hadn't lost its first love. They were willing to die for it. And because of that, today, there are approximately 100,000 people in Smyrna who call themselves Christians. Now, I know and I suspect that they're probably not all genuine Christians, since intergenerational Christianity tends to be diluted, but it certainly is a testimony to the character of the early church at Smyrna who faithfully suffered through the most intense persecution. And you know something? They left a lasting legacy that can't be denied. Now, another thought struck my mind as I was studying this passage. If the Lord tarries another 2,000 years, I don't think he will, but suppose he did. We're 2,000 miles, 2,000 years out from Smyrna. So now, and there are 100,000 so-called Christians at least in Smyrna. So let's suppose for a moment the Lord tarries for another 2,000 years. I wonder what visible, visible legacy Bible Presbyterian Church of Collingswood will have left behind. You have ever pondered that? I believe the Lord's coming back very soon. I don't think we're going to be able to leave a legacy for very long. But if Jesus tarries, what kind of visible legacy will we here at Bible Presbyterian Church of Collingswood leave behind? Even if we leave behind the buildings and if they don't get ta torn down for a shopping center or something like that, simply by people who hate this church, what visible legacy in terms of people will we have left behind? You know, when John wrote the book of Revelation, Smyrna was primarily populated by rich Jews who were bitterly opposed to the gospel. As always, the gospel applied tends to affect the way people view their money and how it should be spent. That means that when the gospel takes effect, people learn to give sacrificially instead of hoarding all that they can get, no matter who gets run over in the process. Last week, we saw that Polycarp, the disciple of John the Apostle, was the chief pastor of the church. He'd learned his lessons well from John and became one of the most famous martyrs of the early church when he was killed in about 169 AD. And so we end up with a direct contrast and comparison between Smyrna and Ephesus. Ephesus had multiple elders chosen and ordained by Paul, but they later split apart as he had prophesied and ended up with a church that established one of the most horrible doctrines of Rome. We say it's one of the most horrible because it transfers the glory of Christ to Mary, who in this case is merely the renaming of a pagan fertility goddess. Ephesus suffered no persecution, but they fell. On the other hand, and in contrast, Smyrna had one faithful man who passed the torch to one faithful man. John passed it to Polycarp, and Polycarp stood firm unto death. The whole church suffered at the hands of the synagogue of Satan. They suffered imprisonment. They suffered torture. They suffered martyrdom. But they remained steadfast, and that church still remains today. You know, it's interesting as you compare the cultures, too. The, Ephes the Ephesian culture griped that they didn't have money. <laughs> Remember, they said Paul was destroying their income. You know, this by this we have our income. Because he was, 
he was preaching against Diana and they made shrines to Diana and the people weren't buying them when they got saved. The church apparently had plenty of money since nothing is mentioned about their temporal needs. But at Smyrna, the persecutors were rich Jews. And the text specifically states that the people in the church were poor in terms of temporal riches. I think there's an important lesson in this. It is not money that keeps a church going, it's people. It's people of a special kind. If a church is growing with committed people, it will survive even if it has no money and even if it is under the most intense persecution and opposition from outside. The believers at Smyrna also had the promise of crowns for holding on faithfully. That's the great and precious promise of heavenly rewards. The New Testament has a lot to say about crowns. Remember it said, Fear none of those things, is Revelation 2.10, which thou shalt suffer, behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, you'll have tribulation ten days, but be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. The New Testament has a lot to say about crowns. We find that crowns are connected to extreme striving for Christ, not mediocre service. Paul talks about the athletic competition he talks about how he keeps under his body and brings it into subjection so by any means he should be a castaway. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 25 through 27, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate, that means self-controlled, in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible, that is an incorruptible crown, one that will never perish. I therefore so run. He wasn't jogging, he was running. This is a race. Not as uncertainly, I wasn't sort of running around the track and picking up stuff, you know, the, the myth about, uh, I forget the name of which goddess it was and which, uh, you know, the young man was trying to uh, win her heart and she kept throwing down the golden apples and he kept picking them up and running. Uh, and he wasn't running uncertainly. Paul wasn't. So fight I, not as one that beats the air. He says, I'm not shadow boxing. I'm, I'm in there and I'm getting hit and I'm hitting back. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Castaway or crowns? Castaway or crowns? It's your choice. At Smyrna, they chose crowns. That's the right choice to make. It's going to cost you something going to cost you some time, some energy. It's going to mean that you're going to be 100% dedicated to Christ. You're not going to offer him mediocre Christian service. It means that if you're put on the line, you will look the barrel of the rifle of the firing squad straight in the eyes, look up to heaven and smile as they pull the trigger. Be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. Crowns are also connected to people that we've led to Christ. We see two passages of this, Philippians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. These were people Paul had led to Christ, and he counted them as a crown. 1 Thessalonians 2.19 For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ in his coming. Oh, you Thessalonians, when Jesus comes back, you're one of my crowns. Have you ever led anybody to Christ? Do you have that kind of crown? Are they your joy and hope and crown of rejoicing. By the grace of God, he's given me the privilege of leading quite a number, including among my children, to Christ. Including one of my dear little granddaughters. Including others who are not part of my family. 
These are my crowns of rejoicing. I pray for them. I pray that as they continue, they'll far away from me now. That God will also give them the same kind of crowns of rejoicing. Crowns are connected to ending life in faithful service. 2 Timothy 4.8 Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day and not to me only but unto all them also that love his appearing. Crowns. Ending life in faithful service. Look at James chapter 1 verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation for when he is tried. What was happening to Smyrna? They were tried. They were faithful unto death. They got the crown of life. James says, Blessed is a man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, when he's put to the test, he shall receive the same thing that Smyrna received, the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them. That, ha, oh, look, what is, to them that, that do lots of cool tap dances in front of the church and do strobe lights and sing wooey songs into microphones. To them that the thing that Ephesus didn't have but Smyrna did hath promised to them that love him. They're tried. They're faithful unto death. They get the crown of life just like it's promised to Smyrna. The Lord hath promised to them that love him. Ephesus could have had that crown just by loving Christ. They didn't even go through suffering and persecution. The crown is promised to them that love him. How about 1 Peter 5, 4? And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Here you are, ending life in faithful service. Here you are, the Lord is coming back, you're still alive, you're caught up to meeting, you're going to get a crown, a crown of glory that will never fade. And of course we have our passage, which is Revelation 2.10, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried. You shall have tribulation ten days, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. But the final passage is one that should cause us to be sober-minded. It's written to one of the other churches, and we'll talk more about it when we get there, but Revelation chapter 3, verse 11. Crowns can be lost. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast which thou hast, that no man Take thy crown. Smyrna. There's the church that was faithful unto death. The church that received the crown of life. A faithful man who passed the torch to another faithful man who was faithful unto death as an example for the church that also was faithful unto death and today in that location there are over 100,000 people one third of the population who call themselves Christians in spite of being surrounded by vicious killers among the Muslims who want to wipe them out. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for the church at Smyrna. It has much to teach us. We pray, Father, that you will make us the kind of people that compose that church. It was a small church. It was a heavily persecuted church. It was a church where people were being tortured, where people were being persecuted and martyred, where people were being imprisoned. 
But the risen Lord was the one who reminded them that the worst that anybody can do to you is to kill you. And he's the one who is alive from the dead. We don't have to fear the worst that men can do unto us. Because what he promised them at the end was not a crown of pleasure, not a crown of money, not a crown of material possessions. We're dealing with life and death. And so he promised them a crown of life. The risen Lord is the only one that can promise a crown of life. Make us a people, Father, who are faithful unto death, if that is what you call us to face. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn this evening. I can figure out what I did with my hymn book. Is number 674. Let's stand and sing, Who is on the Lord?